morning to all our participants who have joined us in today's event. Welcome to the second installment of the European Foreign and Security Policy in the Indo-Pacific webinar series, where we will focus on the evolving frontiers in maritime governance. As the concept of maritime governance and security evolved and expanded over the years to include non-traditional security issues such as freedom of navigation, exclusive economic zones, and marine biodiversity, this has prompted new frontiers of governance to emerge. This session of the webinar will particularly examine possible partnerships and cooperation states can pursue in the realms of public-private partnerships, regional cooperation, marine biodiversity, and the marine co maritime commons as well, as what the role, uh, what role the European foreign and security policy with its Indo-Pacific strategy can play. It is a pleasure to see all of you here. My name is Denise Alcantara Garcia. I am a journalist and coral reef researcher. I am a Fulbright alumna who recently graduated from the University of California, San Diego's Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I took up Master of Advanced Studies in Mar Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. I am currently a postmastoral fellow at De La Salle University's Brother Alfred Shields FSC Ocean Research Center, where I am currently looking into the intersections of reef science and governance to inform policies related to coral reef management and conservation in the Philippines. It is a pleasure to be with you, with all of you here, despite the really rainy weather here in Manila. And I will be your host and moderator for today's program. So today's webinar is brought to you by Facts Asia, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Philippines, and the Foundation of, for the National Interest. To officially open the session, may we call on Vice Admiral Jose Luis Alano, Chairman, Board, Tres Board of Trustees of the Foundation for National Interest, followed by Ms. Marie Schroeter, FES Resident Representative for our welcome welcoming remarks. Vice Admiral? His Excellency Andreas Michael Pafernoska, German Ambassador to the Philippines, Ms. Marie Scrouter, FES Resident uh, Representative, distinguished guests, our esteemed speakers, fellow Filipinos of a maritime nation, ladies and gentlemen, a wonderful maritime archipelagic morning to everyone. As the month of September per Presidential Proclamation 316, Series of 2017, is declared as Maritime Archipelagic Nation Awareness Month. The proclamation, which is only six years, highlights the Philippines' commitment to exercise good governance in protecting the nation's marine wealth under its maritime jurisdiction with a purpose to harmonize, integrate, and synchronize programs and activities that will raise national consciousness on maritime and archipelagic issues and policies, as well as to foster partnership between public and private sectors to further promote public awareness on maritime and archipelagic concerns. As we welcome you, it is just fitting that we acknowledge Fax Asia in collaboration with Frederick Herbert Stifton Philippines in organizing the second event in the webinar series of European Foreign Security Policy in the Pacific, entitled Evolving Frontiers in Maritime Governance. For this morning's event, we will look into the changing dynamics of maritime governance. Regional states are increasingly challenged to balance interests in maritime security while preserving sustainable biodiversity and allowing private sectors to secure business interests. In particular, the webinar will examine which possible partnership and cooperation that states pursue 
in the aforementioned realms and what role European foreign security policy with its Indo-Pacific strategy can play. This is highly relevant with the current regional geopolitical developments that is facing challenges to ocean governance, particularly on activities causing maritime or rather marine value and environmental degradation in the likes of massive reclamation and artificial island building, illegal unreported and unregulated fishing, or of recent highly volatile incidents between law enforcement agents of claimant states in the South China Sea. Further heightened with the recent publication of China's latest version of its national map, which would surely make for a lively discussion. Through the efforts of our organizing team, and as with previous webinar, we are again fortunate to have assembled an esteemed panel of international experts who will unpack for us the various issues surrounding ocean governance, addressing the topic from different perspectives. We have Mr. Gunter, Gunter Erhal, founder, head consultant of Heart Consulting. Dr. Charina Lin Amadeo Ripolio, Deputy Director for Research and Development, Marine Science Institute, University of the Philippines. And Ms. Benedetta Girardi, Strategic Analyst, the Hague Center for Strategic Studies. For those who've been following the webinar series, welcome again. It is great to have you back. And we highly appreciate your patronage. For those who are with us virtually for the first time, we too welcome you and look forward to your valued participation, which reflects your commitment to an open and free discussion towards crafting meaningful policies for good governance in our maritime domain. Allow me to conclude with a quote by historian Fernand Proudel. The seas have been the matrix of civilization. Mabuhay sa inyong lahat. Thank you for that warm welcome, Vice Admiral Alano. Uh, now we welcome Ms. Marie Schroeter. Thank you, Denise. Um, good morning from my side and a warm welcome to Mr. Ambassador Prafanoshke, Vice Admiral Luis Alano, and our invited distinguished speakers, as well as Denise, our facilitator, and of course, all of our guests. For those who are new to the FES, um, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung FES is a German foundation who promotes the ideas and values of social democracy in 105 offices worldwide. And for those who follow the FES in the Philippines a little bit longer, I have realized that my predecessor hasn't gone for so long. So I just arrived in this new position um, roughly a month ago, and I'm very happy to be here in this wonderful country. So welcome everyone to the FNI FES webinar series on European foreign and security policy in the Indo-Pacific. This is the second webinar, as has already been said, highlighting the evolving frontiers in maritime governance, a timely topic in observance with the World Maritime Day this September. We are grateful to the FNI for this partnership, aiming to contribute on discourse on maritime security and governance in the context of the EU's policies and strategies in the Indo-Pacific. This is in line with our work in the Regional Geopolitical Program on unpacking EU strategies and policies towards the Indo-Pacific. As stressed by Dr. Dr. Stephen Blockmans, who's research director at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels, what happens in the, in the Indo-Pacific does not stay in the Indo-Pacific. Whether it is maritime security, freedom of navigation, trade or climate change, Developments in this region have a direct bearing on economic and social realities in the EU. There's no denying on the importance of this region as engine of the world's economic growth. It's increasing importance to the EU, to great and middle powers, 
require further unpacking of what we need to explore and understand in order to maximize the potentials of the region and ensure a rules-based international order. During the first webinar, we set the framework discussing the role of the EU in the Indo-Pacific, the rivalry of the big powers, namely US and China, which have a dominant influence, and how middle powers can neutralize a polarized system and lean towards further multilateralism and regional cooperation. For our second webinar, we will zoom into maritime space and ocean governance and how this will affect regional cooperation, economic security and sustainability. From the traditional maritime security discussions and disputes, there's a growing need to explore most discussions on the other aspects of maritime space and governance. And we are grateful to the experts joining us today, shedding light on important aspects of maritime governance, marine biodiversity, and securing maritime commons. The discussion on maritime governance can also raise issues on just transition. With the changing dynamics of maritime governance, how do we make sure that national and business interests are upheld without negatively affecting the biodiversities of the waters. We look forward to this webinar series to open up platforms for our partners, learning more about the European Union strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific and its similarities and differences with the ASEAN outlook onto the Indo-Pacific region. We are very delighted to have Mr. Ambassador Pafanoshka today here. He also just recently arrived in the Philippines as far uh, as I'm informed after his latest assignment in Burkina Faso. Ambassador Pafanoshka can look back on a rich and diverse diplomatic career with postings in Paris, New York, Geneva, Moscow, Dakar, and back home in Germany. That sounds to me like a diplomat who's looking for challenges. And I assume you're just in the right place here. Um, so with that rich experience, it doesn't come as a surprise to have seen you recently, Mr. Ambassador, already on CNN, voicing the German positions on the most pressing issues of the region here. So without further ado, um, we're looking forward to hearing your remarks and thanks again for taking the time of being here. Well, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me and see me. Yes? All good? Yes, sir. Fine, okay. Thank you very much, dear Mrs. Schroeder, dear Admiral, Vice Admiral Alano, distinguished speakers, and uh, I would say dear online participants. It is indeed an honor to be here with you. And as Ms. Schroeder just said, yes, I arrived five weeks ago. I'm new to the region and I feel very much welcomed and happy to be here. But let me first start by extending a very warm congratulation to Friedrich Ebert Foundation for organizing this webinar, and for giving me the honor to deliver a short keynote speech at the beginning of this definitely interesting webinar. The topic we are dealing with today is, excuse me, is crucially important and the title Evolving Frontiers in Maritime Governance might already indicate what lies ahead. A future characterized by evolving frontiers. Frontiers, which we see unfortunately evolving in many parts of the world, very clearly in Europe, since the outbreak of the war of Russia against Ukraine, but also evolving frontiers in the Indo-Pacific. Let me jump right into today's discussion. What is the European perspective on the Indo-Pacific region? What is Europe's foreign security policy in the region? And as I speak as the German ambassador to the Philippines, what can be Germany's contributions and what is our role in the region, 10,000 kilometers away from Berlin? The Indo-Pacific region is on the rise. The region with booming markets, with a young and skilled workforce, hungry for innovation and prosperity, with regional organizations like ASEAN striving for achieving peace and security in the region. But it's also a region with rising tensions and challenges. 
Recent events in the South China Sea have very clearly demonstrated how fragile the situation is and how important it is to find sustainable and negotiated solutions for peace and stability in the region. And let me say, and uh, Vice Admiral already referred to it in his introductory remarks, unilaterally drawing new geographical maps without the consent of other countries in the region concerned does definitely not contribute to peace and stability. It only leads to new frontiers in the region and in maritime governance. The same, of course, holds true for any attempt to block supply ships in the, in the exclusive economic zone of a country. Ladies and gentlemen, the Indo-Pacific will determine perhaps more than any other place in the world today, the future of the international order for the century to come. That's why I value, I value very much the opportunity to talk about European perspectives today. Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine, breaking with international rules and using crude violence against a peaceful country continues to challenge the international world order more than 18 months now. And it is because of Russia's war of aggression that Europe and Germany remain firm in our commitment to the Indo-Pacific and in defending the international rules-based order everywhere in the world. Firm in defending the international order in Europe and in the South China Sea. We defend it wherever we can. In the aftermath of the Second World War and during the Cold War, Germany has learned painfully what it means if rules are not respected, if your neighbor is threatening you with military means. So let me come back to what that means for our current engagement in and our commitment to the Indo-Pacific region, trading nation. Millions of jobs in Germany depend on our trade with other countries. Germany is the biggest trading partner of the Philippines and the most important investor within the European Union. We share every interest in an Indo-Pacific region that is peaceful, where international law is respected and every country is free to determine its future and making independent political and economic choices. New frontiers, new borders are the last we need and the last we want to see. This includes, of course, security of shipping routes in Southeast Asia and sea lines of communication of vital interest to the EU and Germany. Instability in this vital region would affect one third of global maritime trade, which crosses through the South China Sea. As a result, the EU and Germany are expanding our cooperation in working closely with all our partners in the region with the aim to uphold a rules-based order that has been the essential foundation for unprecedented growth, peace and stability in the region over the last decades. The Philippines are a very important partner in this respect. In 2020, Germany has adopted its policy guidelines for the Indo-Pacific. Germany pursues an approach that is open, transparent and inclusive, an approach based on rules and multilateral cooperation that stands to benefit everyone. With these guidelines, we commit to step, our, to step up our engagement vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN by different initiatives. In the area of strengthening peace and security, the German government is continuing its efforts to protect the rules-based international order in the South China Sea by doing its utmost to safeguard the principles of UNCLOS and expanding security and defense cooperation with our regional partners. We would like to be even more closely involved in this meeting. Meetings plus the ADM ambition mechanisms and by pursuing cyber security cooperation and dialogue the 2016 arbitral award on the South China Sea. The award of 2016 is legally binding
on both parties. In China, we learn on the aggression of Chinese Coast Guard boats against resupply missions to Sierra Madre at the second Thomas shelf. We would also be willing to support the creation of a legally binding code of conduct between China. there is the wish of countries concerned to pursue this option. We are opposed to the formation. No one should be forced to choose sites. No country is or should be the backyard of any other country. Germany will always support multilateral cooperation to reduce tensions, as well as limits the risk of escalation and solve disputes peacefully. Excuse me. Ladies Honorable and gentlemen, Ambassador. disputes around land claims are not yet. Yes. Uh, um, your connection is a bit unstable. So if you could um, maybe speak slower so that uh, we can catch some and of the words. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very sorry. Yeah, this is the internet. I'm sorry for that. Okay, I, I start again with the last sentence. Disputes around land claims are not new, but they are becoming increasingly tense and the prospect of violent escalation is rising with the buildup of military infrastructure and dangerous encounters on the open sea. But power and might do not make right. Ladies and gentlemen, Germany is definitely not an Indo-Pacific power in military terms, and we do have no intention to become one. Other partners, including European partners, are better positioned to do so. We have no permanent military presence and we are not striving for it in the region. Our presence in the region is focused on Europe's role as a partner interested in defending the international rules-based order and in promoting mutually advantageous economic, economic relations. We do this as a member of the EU and we align ourselves fully with the EU strategy for the Indo-Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm convinced that evolving new frontiers are in nobody's interest. Countries in the region with the support of friends and like-minded partners should do their utmost to avoid new maritime frontiers. We need common dialogue. sustainable solutions and the future of the region. Germany stands ready to face these pressing challenges together with our partners in the Indo-Pacific. I wish this webinar all success. May it contribute to avoiding the involvement of new frontiers. Thank you very much for your attention and very sorry if the connection was not as it should be. I hope you got the thrust of my message and I hope maybe in the future or in the hours to come, it will be better to listen to what I might have to add. Thank you very much for your attention again. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comprehensive and enlightening remarks uh, from Ambassador Pafarinoshke. Indeed, the Indo-Pacific region has been one of the areas that have received increased interest from international actors. Its popularity and importance in the international arena in recent years may be linked to the growing significance of the oceans, not just in the realm of security, but in economics, politics, culture, and the environment. The Indo-Pacific contains numerous resources, trade routes, maritime infrastructures, and shipment ports whose values have increased due to the globalization and growing interdependencies among states. The importance of its maritime space is highlighted by the increased involvement of great and middle powers. So for this webinar, we have three esteemed speakers who will be given 20 minutes each to discuss their views and insights. Before I introduce them, our organizers have requested a quick photo session. Um, Florence, please let us know um, once you've captured a screenshot. So everybody smile.
um, turn your cameras on, please, for the participants as well. Oh, um, one, two, three, smile. Okay, one more. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Florence. So now we can go into the discussion. Let us start delving into this relevant discussion as I introduce our first speaker for today's webinar, Mr. Gunther Erholt. He is the founder and head consultant of Erholt Consulting. Mr. Gunther is a U.S. Navy veteran and has regional fishery management organization experience. He graduated from Middlebury Institute of International Studies with a master's degree in international trade and economic diplomacy. He has worked on projects for international groups such as the United States Coast Guard, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Global Fishing Watch, and Japanese research institutions. He is an aspiring polyglot who currently speaks Mandarin, Japanese, and English. Let us welcome Mr. Gunther Erholt. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to present here today. Um, there we go. I know the Germans in the audience might be surprised um, that I am American with such a name, but. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to speak here today. Um, you can see me, I assume, and you can hear me, so we can continue. Uh, so today I wanna talk about uh, public and private partnerships in maritime governance. Uh, as stated, uh, I have been working in this uh, field for a while now, mostly with Coast Guards and enforcement bodies dealing in illegal fisheries. Thank you, this is the slide I want. Um, so working with U.S. Coast Guard, Canada, Republic of Korea, conversations with Maldives, Sri Lanka, and so on. So throughout the Asia Pacific region. Um, next slide. Sorry, is excuse me, Mr. Erhold. Oh, we can't see you actually. Can you turn on your video? Uh, my video is on. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> So uh, the way I look at it is there's two different ways of looking at uh, public-private partnerships. There's one, which is the true definition of the word, where the government and private industry work together in collaboration to create a unique entity, uh, which is partially operated by the government and also by private industry. And there's another way of looking at that type of partnership, which can be where the government comes out with policy or proposal which is then funneled through NGOs who can actually do some of the work in regions that governments may not be able to reach. If we look at some of those policies or proposals being put out by governments, we can see that, for example, uh, President Joe Biden put out a memorandum against combating illegal fishing and labor abuses in the ocean. We have the EU carding uh, policies, which can go through and force governments uh, uh, industries in certain regions to act in order to make sure that their products can continue to be uh, imported or exported to the EU countries. And we also have other instances with Canada and the United States offering up money to different platforms and industries to uh, solve some capability gaps in certain regions. So to give some examples of those, we have Global Fishing Watch, Skylight, TMT, these are NGOs operating in the region, operating across the world, who are um, trying to fill some of the gaps that governments are unable to do. Um, with the ease of getting satellite data and uh, big data, some Silicon Valley groups uh, like Global Fishing Watch, which is originally started by Google, realize that they can start utilizing AI machine learning to uh, fill some of those gaps that the governments are unable to do in certain regions, utilizing the AIS, uh, satellite imagery, uh, optical imagery, and so on. We have other groups like MDA Space, 
um, or MDA, EU, uh, Primario as well, who operate more closer to a, what a true public-private partnership is uh, with the government and private industry working in tandem within these organizations to provide a product, to provide a service uh, which can help in maritime governance and MDA. Uh, next slide. So now let's go, thank you, let's go and do uh, examples of what that would be. Oh, next slide, please. So um, I quickly just mentioned MDA. Uh, MDA Space is a Canadian-owned company in geo-intelligence and satellite systems, robotics, and space operations. They work in Canada on a lot of their uh, satellites as well as their space station. Uh, but recently, Canada has came into a more public-private partnership, uh, true sense of the word, with MDA, with RadarSat, so Radar Satellite, in order to have uh, the oceans scanned and to have better imagery of those regions. There was a gap where there was imagery of vessels close to shore, which could be provided uh, originally through the EU satellites, but not within the open ocean. So Canada uh, worked with their team in MDA to create a new platform, which can identify more uh, satellite radar imagery uh, in different areas which previously were dark. Uh, next slide. And here's an example of what that tool looks like. Uh, each of these vessels located here around the Galapagos Islands are represented by these green, yellow, and orange dots. You can then click on individual vessels and see uh, the actual uh, radar imagery of that vessel, as well as gaining some intelligence and information on what that vessel is and who they are. Uh, next slide. And this tool is very useful. Um, Canada investing in tools like this helps not only them in their maritime domain awareness, but can help uh, other regions as well. Uh, Canada and MDA partner, partnering with the Pacific Island countries, uh, 15 of them, which operate uh, the largest EEZs in the world uh, when all put together. Um, these are you know, small countries uh, with small populations, but a lot of ocean to try and cover. And it can make things very difficult. So Canada uh, stepping up, helping with the creation of this platform uh, and providing it to these nations to help in their enforcement of their EEZs, protect their sovereignty from illegal fishing and other uh, illicit maritime acts, not only benefits Canada because the illicit crimes happening within this EEZ can make their way back to Taiwan, to Korea, to Japan, to the US, to Canada, either through importation, um, through dirty supply chain, and so on. Um, so this doesn't just help Canada, but it helps other nations as well, and works as a good uh, diplomatic play to show uh, Canada's good faith in this in this region. Next slide. And on top of that, we mentioned how governments are working with NGOs and the same type of public-private partnership type of situation. Um, they can give money to these NGOs to investigate and improve their tools, which the governments do not have, and that these tools can then be provided to other governments to also enforce and protect their maritime boundaries. But on top of that, the programs that are created by Canada um, are also being fed into those NGO platforms, which are provided for free to other countries. So Canada uh, investing uh, in this public-private partnership to get better uh, radar satellite can then also help other countries through these NGOs and improving uh, just global maritime domain awareness. Next slide. Outside of the uh, MDA uh, dark vessel detection software, we also have uh, Crimario. Now this is an EU program that some of the room are probably familiar with. 
Uh, CREMARIA stands for Capacity Building in Maritime Domain Awareness in the Indian Ocean Region. Um, and what they're hoping to do is create a um, information sharing and coordination platform within the region so that things uh, can be easier, uh, be tracked easier, uh, whether that's piracy, illegal fishing, um, damaged supply chain, uh, missing cargo vessels, whatever it may be. And this is one effective tool that the EU is using in the region. While not a pure public-private partnership because it was created by the EU, it is managed uh, by a group which is a public-private partnership. Uh, next slide. And just to kind of drive this home, I wanted to show a couple uh, news articles uh, showcasing how effective uh, government um, interest, um, the announcement of certain policies, and invest uh, investment in their own platforms or into NGO platforms can be within these regions. You can see this Global Fishing Watch case where 800 Chinese vessels were found fishing in North Korean waters, breaking EU sanctions, or uh, Skylight and uh, Ioris, the EU Cumario uh, system, working together to share data, uh, working together in West Africa to stop illegal fishing and uh, human rights violations on fishing vessels. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And without governments supporting NGOs, uh, creating their own uh, public-private partnerships um, to address some of those capacity gaps that some countries that may especially be struggling, like in West Africa, within the Pacific, um, may be struggling with, uh, we'll never be able to truly end some of these uh, issues, such as piracy and IUUF. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and um, with that, I will end my presentation and be open for questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Erhalt, for that um, insightful discussion. Um, for our participants, uh, we will hold an open forum after all three speakers have spoken. Um, so please hold your questions, or you can um, start typing in your questions in the Q&A box. So as a short summary, um, there are different ways on how to uh, um, collaborate between government and private institutions. And thank you, Mr. Erhold, for providing um, very concrete examples from Canada and, um, and the EU as well. Um, I'm sure our participants would have many questions uh, later today, um, but now we can move on to the second speaker. Our second speaker is Dr. Charina Lim Amedo Repolio. She holds the position of Assistant Professor at the Marine Science Institute of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and was recently appointed as Deputy Director for Research and Development. She earned her BSc in Fisheries from the University of the Philippines in the Visayas in 1998, and later pursued her MSc in Marine Science from UPMSI. Her academic journey culminated with the completion of her PhD in Oceanography from the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2016. Dr. Repolio specializes in physical oceanography with a primary focus on coastal and island oceanography, the dynamics of the surface layer and air-sea interactions. Her research is centered around the study of mesoscale and coastal processes, including their underlying driving factors. She employs a comprehensive approach by integrating data from an assortment of in situ and remote sensing instruments in conjunction with global and regional models to explore the influence of ocean physics in the distribution and state of the marine ecosystem in the context of climate change. An essential facet of her work involves her active participation in the development of programs aimed at managing tropical marine ecosystems. Furthermore, she contributes to the realm of oceanography in the Philippines 
with the ultimate goal of fostering decision making grounded in in scientific insights. So let us all welcome Dr. Charina Lim Amedo Repolio. Hello, good morning, everybody. So can I share my screen now? Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. And can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So good morning, everybody, to our Honorable Vice Admiral Jose Luis Alano, to Honorable uh, Ambassador Andreas Michael Puffer Noske, to our distinguished speakers, guests, and for those joining us from around the country or rather the world. I'm truly delighted to be here with you today as we gather for this important webinar. I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to Fax Asia, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and the FNI for extending the invitation to me to be one of their speakers. So uh, regional cooperation in marine biodiversity conservation is crucial aspect of the Philippines' effort to protect and sustainably manage its marine resources. The Philippines, as you all know, is an archipelagic nation with vast marine territory and rich marine diverse biodiversity. Recognize the importance of working collaboratively with neighboring countries and regional organizations to address common challenges and achieve shared goals. So here are some of the key aspects of regional cooperation in marine biodiversity in the Philippines. So very good example is the Coral Triangle Initiative. So this initiative we're in Philippines is part of this uh, Coral Triangle. So as you see the Coral Triangle, you know, is a region known for its exceptional marine biodiversity. So with this initiative, it fosters collaboration and various conservation, research and capacity building efforts. Next is the ASEAN Cooperation or the Association of Southeast Asian Cooperation uh, Asian Nations. So here, member states work together to address challenges related to marine biodiversity conservation pollution and sustainable fisheries management. Next is the Regional Fisheries Management Organizations or what they call the RFMOs. So here the Philippines participates and such participation allows for coordinated efforts in managing fish stocks in the region. And next is the Transboundary Marine Protected Areas. So this one is a collaborative effort with neighboring countries that led to the establishment of transboundary MPAs in the Sulu Sulawesi seascape. So these protected areas aim to conserve biodiversity and fisheries resources that extends across national boundaries. And next is the conduct of marine scientific research. So this area I am active with in our institute. So here the Philippines engage in joint marine scientific research and data sharing agreements with neighboring countries. And this collaboration contributes to a better understanding of our marine ecosystems and species distributions, leading to a more informed conservation efforts. And then the last one is the regional agreements and the protocols. So Philippines is a signatory to several regional agreements and protocols related to marine biodiversity. And this includes under, those under the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is called CBD, which I will discuss further in my presentation. So first, let me introduce to you to the 
interesting marine environment of the Philippines. And so as you know, Philippines is an archipelagic country. And here, let's see on how regional cooperation in marine biodiversity conservation helps the Philippines address the challenges that transcend national borders. So Philippines is composed of several islands, 7,641. So we have seven times more total water area than our total land area. So we are one of the long, having the longest total coastline in the world, actually in the top five. And we have 78% of our provinces and 56% of cities or municipalities lies along the coastline. And located at the apex of the Coral Triangle, the Philippines is an integral part of this global center of marine biodiversity. So the Philippines is a uh, party to the Convention on Biological Diversity, or the CDP, which was adopted in 1992, Rio Earth Summit in Brazil, and has since become an international law. So the Philippines is identified as one of the world's 17 most biologically rich countries. Its terrestrial and marine habitats are characterized by high endemism wherein nearly half of all its flora and fauna are within its borders. However, it is also one of the hotspots for biodiversity loss and ranked among the top 10 countries with the largest number of species threatened with extinction. So as a party to the CBD, Philippines accepted certain time-bound obligations in return for a more sustainable future. So in compliance with this obligation, so the 1997 National Biodiversity Strategic Action Plan, or what they call the NBSAP, was formulated, which under Article 6 of the Convention is the principal instrument for implementing the Convention at the national level. In 2022, this 1997 NBSAP has been updated with the publication of the 2015-2028 Philippine Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, or what they call the PBSA. So this plan builds on the achievement uh, thus far made in fulfilling the CBD obligations, particularly the commitment to implement the CBD Strategic Plan for Biodiversity for 2011 to 2020. So the NBSAP is the country's roadmap to conserve its biodiversity and to achieve its vision that by 2028, uh, biodiversity is restored and rehabilitated, valued, effectively managed, and secured, maintaining ecosystem services to sustain healthy, resilient Filipino communities and delivering benefits to all. On the other hand, the Philippine Development Plan for 2023 for 2028 serve as our country's overall blueprint in development planning for the next six years. So it reflects the government policies, strategies, programs, and legislative priorities in support of and consistent with President Ferdinand R. Marcos Jr.'s socioeconomic agenda. The plan is geared toward attainment of the country, long-term vision, the ambition natin 2040 where all Filipinos are envisioned to enjoy strongly rooted, comfortable, and secure lives. PSAP is anchored in the PDP plan. While the PDP adopts the framework for inclusive growth, the PBSAP articulates the same direction of pursuing economic growth while protecting the environment. This emphasizes that people are the core of conservation, protection, and rehabilitation and developmental initiatives. So here are the PBSAP strategy and action plan. So it has identified 20 targets to address conservation, ecosystem services, human well-being, reduce threats in biodiversity, and address the drivers of those threats. So, as a contracting party to the CBD, the Philippines submits to the convention every five years 
a national report of measure it has taken for the implementation of provisions of the convention and their effectiveness in meeting the objectives of the convention. And from the latest uh, six national report for CBD in 2019, DNR reported that 50 are on track. So you can see it here. And um, they were able to achieve the targets while, far, while five are with progress in insufficient rates for those that are crossed with a diagonal red line. So last December 19, 2022, the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework or what they call the KMGBF was adopted by the fifth conference of party or the COP15 to the CBD to which the Philippines is also a party. So here was the uh, meeting held in Montreal. And shown here are the four goals and the 23 action-oriented targets of the uh, KMGBF. So one that I will highlight here is the agreement of the GBF in the protection of 30% of the Earth's land and ocean by the year of 2030, which is the KMGF target tree here inside the red circle, or simply called the 30 by 30. So here is what they call the KMGF PSAP will, showing how the PSAP contributes to achieving national targets and international commitments. So this is a sort of an overview of the Philippine um, uh, Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan as the overall framework for biodiversity conservation in the country. And that how the Philippines envisions to operationalize the KMGF and its linkages to the country's premium medium term plan and international commitments like the PDP Development Plan and the BDNG Treaty. So in the Philippines, the DNR under the uh, BMB or the Biodiversity Management Bureau has developed an initial roadmap that projects an area of 18.5% of terrestrial and 16% of marine protected areas in the Philippines under the National Integrated Protected Area System or NIPAS by 2030. To achieve the 30 by 30, we have yet to protect 14.5% of total Philippine land area and 28.58% of Philippine Sea area. Moreover, the BMB is currently developing a national policy for the identification and recognition of other effective area-based conservation measures or what they call OECMs in order to account for the contribution of these areas to the overall 30 by 30 commitment of the country. So currently, here are the initiatives of the NR. So presently, it's for heading the updating of the PBSAP in line with the KMGBF through conduct of series of consultations and workshops. And then conduct national consultation workshop on the draft DNR administrative order for the identification and the recognition of other effective area-based conservation measures and mainstreaming biodiversity across sectors um, like uh, biodiversity-friendly enterprises, BD-friendly agricultural practices, enhancing BD conservation in mining operation, urban biodiversity conversation, mainstreaming in the infrastructure uh, sector. So in recognition of the growing efforts and willingness of institutions and organizations to help achieve the ambitious global conservation target, so a recent event uh, was held and in there they formally launched the 30 by 30 Philippines and was organized by DNR BMB uh, in partnership with the Wildlife Conservation Society of the Philippines through their 30 by 30 accelerator grant and Bloomberg Ocean Fund. 
and is also supported by different partners like the embassies of the United Kingdom and France in the Philippines, uh, the United National Development Program through the GF, GBF Early Action Support and Biodiversity Corridor Projects, the Philippine National Commission for UNESCO, US AID Inspire Project, Forest Foundation of the Philippines, Center for Sustainability Philippines, Save Philippine Seas, and the Ocean Pie, Pie which is the MPA support network, wherein the Marine Science Institute is part of through the Marine Environment and Resources Foundation, together with Rare Philippines, Oceana, WWF Philippines, and Conservation International. Uh, Philippines. So the WCS or the Wildlife Conservation Society takes an integrated science-driven approach to support and help finance the global 30 by 30 target to maximize co-benefits for biodiversity, climate mitigation, and adaptation for both nature and people as efficiently as possible while enhancing indigenous people and local communities well being. Currently, WCS is working with confirmed and potential donors to complete the design of the institutional arrangements for the funding partnership among the different donors for the high ambition co-investment platform. And thus accelerate and gather support to deliver the 30 by 30 commitments in priority countries, including the Philippines. So, Marine diversity conservation in the Philippines is a complex and critical endeavor that requires concerted effort from various stakeholders. To effectively conserve marine biodiversity in the Philippines, the European Union as a partner can maybe contribute significantly to these efforts through financial support, technical expertise, knowledge sharing, and collaborative initiatives. The EU can also work closely with the Philippine government, NGOs, local communities, and other stakeholders to develop and implement comprehensive marine conservation strategies and pro projects. Additionally, the EU can also play a role in advocating, advocating global commitments to protect marine biodiversity, such as those outlined in international agreements like the Convention on uh, Biological Diversity, and the sustainable development goals so and support the 30 by 30 uh, Philippines. So at Marine Science Institute, we also have initiative to support the effort for um, regional marine biodiversity conversation, uh, conservation. So here you can see our uh, office here at the University of the Philippines. Uh, inside the Diliman campus and our floating assets. And um, end of this year, we are receiving four more floating assets um, that will be co-managed by different SUCs from the Bicol University, University of the Philippine Visayas, and the Mindanao State University. And also on the right here, you can see our facilities at the Bulinao Pangasinan Marine Laboratory. Uh, the Puerto Galera Biodiversity and Environmental Research and Outreach Center um, in Mindoro, and also our Pagasa Island Research Station in the Kalayaan Islands. So uh, the UPMSI actually, you know, have integrative disciplines, you know, offering graduate school programs, trainings to assist our uh, government in. Uh, preserving our marine biodiversity. So for more details about our institute, you can uh, visit our website and you can scan the QR code to follow us on different media platforms that we have. Thank you at maraming salamat sa lahat. Thank you, Dr. Charina Lin Repolio for giving us updates on how the Philippine government plans to adhere to international agreements such as the Kunming um, Montreal Global Biodiversity Protocol through the Philippine Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan and the Philippine Development Plan and also updating us on the latest initiatives uh, which is very um, exciting such as the 
um, Department of Environment and Natural Resources and under uh, by the, the Biodiversity Management Bureau's um, 30 by 30 Philippines campaign. So it is very evident that with the Philippine archipelago having over seven times more water than land, that's a good reminder that we're more water than land. So we should really um, invest and focus on our marine resources and maritime security because um, our marine resources have a big role in economic development, food and livelihood security. So we can we cannot we can, definitely we cannot attain maritime security without protecting our biodiverse marine resources from shallow coral reefs to our pelagic fishes and deep water deep sea uh, marine resources as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Charina. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So now we proceed to our third speaker. Ms. Benedetta Girardi. She is a strategic analyst at HCSS. Her primary research interests regard the geopolitics and geoeconomics of the Indo-Pacific, European defense and security policy, and the interactions and ties between Europe, China, and the United States. Her research focuses on the role of Europe in the Indo-Pacific with specific attention to supply chains of energy, critical raw materials, and semiconductors, as well as avenues for engagement between European and Indo-Pacific states. Benedetta's work also looks at maritime security and the importance of free and open sea lines of communication. Some of the projects she has worked on examine the importance of guarding the maritime commons, the role of critical raw materials for the European defense industry and the centrality of maritime check choke points to global trade and security. Uh, before working at HCSS, she was a regulatory policy analyst at Reckitt Benkiser, where she focused on matters of sustainability related to the analysis of the European Green, De Green Deal and its effects on the supply chain. She holds a, an MSc in European Affairs from Sciences Po Paris with a specialization in politics and public policy. Previously, she earned her BA in International Studies at the University of McLeiden and McGill University in Canada. Let's give a warm welcome to Ms. Benedit, Ms. Benedetta Girardi. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I hope you can Oh, hear me clearly. Yes. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a honor to be here today. And apologies if uh, the lighting is not the best, but it is currently 4 a.m. in Europe. So I have to uh, with this um, uh, lighting here. Um, but yeah, so my uh, contribution to this uh, enlightening seminar will be uh, on the role of Europe in uh, guarding the maritime commons and uh, how this will um, involve actually how we just put at the center uh, Europe partnerships uh, with uh, Indo-Pacific uh, states. I think before uh, diving into actually cooperation avenues and possibilities, it is fundamental uh, to take a step back and analyze uh, why should uh, Europe care about protecting uh, the maritime commons in an area of the world that is objectively uh, very, very distant from uh, the shoreline of Europe. Um, well, the first and maybe most obvious reason uh, for Europe to do so is its economic interest. 80% um, of the world trade by volume uh, is moved by a sea. And uh, trade between Europe and Asia represents 55% of uh, global trade by volume. Additionally, four out of 10 uh, of European uh, top trading partners are in the Pacific states, namely China, Japan, South Korea, and India. And ASEAN as a, as a whole is the third <clears throat> largest trading partner uh, for the European Union. There is clearly hence uh, economic interest uh, for Europe in the region. Uh, however, these economic interests uh, rely on seaborne trade. This trade passes uh, via maritime choke points, 
that are uh, narrow passageways and straits, for example, the Strait of uh, Malacca, Sunda, Lombok, and Ombai. Uh, these choke points are uh, naturally vulnerable points in the supply chain and trade chains uh, because they are um, narrow, uh, close passageways, uh, close by land that are easily reachable. Um, by piracy, uh, service attacks, and uh, as well as climate hazards. Uh, so Europe, if it wants to keep its trade uh, channels open with uh, the most important region for its economic development, needs to protect these uh, maritime choke points. Um, however, there is also uh, another reason why Europe should care uh, about guarding the maritime commons in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, that is, uh, that we live in an increased era of uh, great power competition, with Sino American uh, tensions being an all time high. I think uh, there is no way to deny that uh, the United States and China are competing politically, economically, uh, and militarily. This means um, that the world is evolving toward a polarized system. Uh, however, for Europe and the EU, it's very important to actually upkeep uh, a multilateral order and uh, an international order based on rules and the rule of law. This is the other uh, reason why it's extremely important for Europe to actually play an active role in guarding the maritime commons in the Indo-Pacific and not only stand by and be uh, a spectator to uh, a situation of evolving importance. I think we can definitely see uh, the shift in interest and priority uh, of Europe and uh, the renewed attention that European states have found uh, for the Indo-Pacific. Um, a witnessing of this is the booming flourishing of uh, Indo-Pacific strategies in uh, European states. Uh, France, the Netherlands, Germany, and least, last but not least, the European Union itself have um, operated uh, Indo-Pacific strategies in the last years. The first was France in 2018, and we go up to uh, the European Union adopting its uh, strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific in September 2021. And these strategies all signal our uh, commitment of European states to the region. Um, the European Union strategy is of particular relevance and importance. Uh, because it, outla it outlines uh, the involvement of the EU as a whole and as a bloc uh, towards the Indo-Pacific region. Um, the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific uh, presents a committed uh, naval presence in the Indo-Pacific, especially through joint exercises and port calls. And it also offers its uh, commitment to strengthen diplomacy with regional actors uh, as well as enhancing naval diplomacy and uh, deployments in the region. It also establishes uh, the Enhancing Security Cooperation in and with Asia initiative, which is very important to reach out to regional partners. And it is uh, a commitment to uh, promote sustainable development goals and bridge uh, Europe with uh, the Indo-Pacific. So the strategy is a very good uh, starting point, and it also resonates uh, partially with ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which is a very important stepping stone uh, on which ASEAN and Europe could build uh, further cooperation. However, it is also uh, very important to be realistic about what Europe can actually do in the Indo-Pacific. Um, in fact, uh, European states have very limited uh, naval capacities, especially when it comes to military vessels. Uh, Europe does not have uh, as many uh, ships materially as, for example, the US and China doesn't even get close to that. Um, and even the ships that it has are uh, needed to be deployed very carefully. In fact, uh, not just not because the country has uh, the vessels, it means that it can deploy them. Um, Usually there is a ratio of four to one. So for each four vessels that a country has, one can be deployed uh, because the others will be busy in training, reparation, and uh, other such uh, commitments. 
So what Europe can do, especially so far away from its shoreline, is in the naval sense uh, limited. However, there are other areas in which the EU has uh, expertise and can play to its strength. And it should do so to actually contribute to guarding the maritime commons in uh, the Indo-Pacific. I think in particular, there are three areas that we can identify as uh, policy areas that Europe should be interested in cooperating with in the Indo-Pacific. The first one is uh, law enforcement. Um, in particular, uh, Europe can contribute to the fight against piracy, illegal, uh, unreported and unregulated fishing, uh, drug and human trafficking uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the EU, in fact, has expertise in this field, uh, and uh, all EU states ad adhere to uh, UNCLOS, which is very important, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. And in particular, European states have expertise in uh, fishing zone issues and exclusive economic zone related matters. So it could definitely um, help with its expertise in this area when it comes uh, to law enforcement. Um, there's also other instances of EU um, cooperation with regional partners when it comes to law enforcement. For example, the ASEAN EU uh, work plan to combat terrorism and even individual states at the EU level uh, can give contribution. For example, uh, the Netherlands already holds uh, law of the sea trainings with ASEAN countries. These are all instances of cooperation in the field of law enforcement that can help with guard uh, the maritime commons in the region. The second area that I think uh, Europe and uh, Indo-Pacific state could cooperate in uh, to guard the maritime commons is uh, the new security challenges and in particular, uh, cyber threats. Uh, there is uh, an enhanced number of cyber attacks on maritime infrastructures, uh, be that port infrastructures or underwater cables. Uh, this is an area um, that is still evolving, but open um, to cooperation for EU and Indo-Pacific states. In particular, what Europe can bring to the table is its expertise uh, and on cybercrime and how to counter cybercrime. Um, this is, for example, um, spelled out in the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime and in the European uh, Policy on Cyber Defense. The lessons learned from um, the North Sea and uh, Europe's cyber uh, fight could be um, brought to the table in a cooperation with Indo-Pacific states. Um, the third area, I think, uh, of cooperation in regards with guarding the maritime commons where Europe can actively contribute to the Indo-Pacific is uh, environment and climate. Uh, the Indo-Pacific is uh, a beautiful albeit um, marked by uh, climate hazards uh, region in the world. And the EU uh, under its Green Deal uh, has um, a specific point of helping out with outreach to other countries to promote biodiversity of which we have heard before um, as well as reduce pollution, water pollution, and the conservation of um, biodiversity and maritime um, hit by maritime commons hit by environmental related issues. Um, the European states are also part of the International Maritime Organization, which could be a further uh, venue of cooperation um, between EU and Indo-Pacific states, and uh, also as individual work expertise, for example, the Netherlands has a huge uh, water expertise and water management expertise that it could help um, contributing to the stability of um, in the Pacific maritime commons. So these are all uh, areas in which Europe can actually contribute to guarding the maritime commons in the Indo-Pacific. Um, however, as I mentioned before, uh, it is an area that is very far uh, from Europe. And uh, so the core of Europe uh, engagement in the region uh, has to be and should be meaningful partnerships with uh, regional states. Um, it, can only, it cannot only be states that sh uh, traditionally share values and beliefs with Europe, uh, but e the EU has to keep an open mind 
and um, be aware of uh, the diversity of regional actors and states in the Indo-Pacific. So I think there are three main configurations in which uh, the European Union and Europe should seek um, partnership in the Indo-Pacific. The first one is through uh, multilateral frameworks. These are uh, large configurations with a lot of states and a lot of parties. Um, and these are particularly useful when it comes, for example, to combating piracy and enhancing maritime domain awareness. Um, multilateral frameworks are good because they are a common, um, they aim at tackling the common goods and, and are equally beneficial to all parties involved and allow for a pooling of resources. Some example of already existing multilateral uh, cooperation in uh, the maritime domain are Operation Atlanta and Erini, uh, but also the Indian Ocean Rhythm Association, uh, Crimario, as mentioned by um, Mr. Harald, and uh, the coordination of maritime presences. The second framework with which uh, Europe could approach uh, in the Pacific states cooperation is uh, minilateral frameworks. Minilateral frameworks are uh, frameworks with uh, smaller parties, so grouping of uh, three, four states or uh, regional bodies such as EU or ASEAN. Uh, these groups are smaller, so are more efficient, especially in time of crisis, because there is less bureaucracy and less mediation involved. Um, example of this is, for example, the uh, France's uh, trilateral on maritime security with India and Australia, or uh, the EU cooperating with uh, information fusion centers in Madagascar and uh, the Seychelles. Last uh, type of, of framework that Europe could uh, explore and should explore is a bilateral relations. European states already have a presence of embassies and consulates in, in the uh, Pacific states. However, uh, these channels can always be strengthened uh, also through naval uh, diplomacy. Um, bilateral framework allow for uh, military and non-military resource pooling, which is very important. And we can see example of this in uh, European states having shared military bases in the region uh, or military logistic agreements or status of forces agreement with uh, in the Pacific states. So um, these are uh, three venues of cooperation for Europe in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I think to conclude, uh, I think it's pretty obvious that Europe has an economic and not only economic interest in guarding the maritime commons in the Indo-Pacific. However, considering its limited uh, naval capabilities and the geographical distance uh, from Europe to the Indo-Pacific, um, it should focus on the areas of law enforcement, cyber, and new uh, emerging threats, as well as environment and climate. In all of this, it's very important for Europe to avoid further uh, polarization between great power, but actually uh, promote meaningful partnerships among equals that are fundamental to neutralize a very uh, polarized region of the world. So to begin with, Europe needs to start listening to the needs of Indo-Pacific states, really um, see the needs of their partners and try to cater to them uh, as much as possible through already existing expertise and frameworks or by creating a new one. Strategies such as the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific are a good start. However, I am personally convinced that uh, more concrete actions need to be uh, taken to actually uh, further very, very central and important cooperation uh, with Indo-Pacific states. Um, deploying vessels in the region is um, a good signal of support to Indo-Pacific states, uh, but it's not sufficient. So I think there's uh, a lot more that Europe can do uh, in cooperation, fundamentally in cooperation with the Indo-Pacific states. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Gerardi, for joining us despite the time difference.
I hope you get you still get to sleep later today. <laughs> um, but sharing your expertise on the European European Union's perspective on maritime security in the Indo-Pacific is truly valuable for us to understand Europe's stand and role on ASEAN maritime issues issues. It is evident that Indo-Pacific nations such as the Philippines cannot battle maritime disputes and issues alone. What I gathered from your talk is that creating meaningful partnerships is or should be of high priority. And um, there are three policy areas that Europe should be interested in, which are First is the law, law enforcement. Second is new security challenges such as the rising number of cyber attacks on maritime infrastructure, which is actually very new to me. And I hope um, we could have further discussion on this later on the open forum. And third, but definitely not the least, is environment and climate. Um, so thank you so much, Ms. Girardi. Um, the next part of our um, program for today is the open forum or question and answer um, section. So for our participants, you may post your questions in the Q&A chat box. Um, so may we call on all our speakers to turn on their cameras again? Um, even um, Ambassador um, and Ms. Schroeter, I hope you can still join us. Thank you. So please don't hesitate to type in more of your questions for our open forum. Okay, so let's get the ball rolling. So for the first round, this is... Um, addressed for the ambassador and Ms. Reuter. Does Germany have programs to help countries such as the Philippines to improve their maritime governance? Yes, if I may, this is a question directly addressed to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, there is no one size fits all program for maritime governance. Mm -hmm. It's different everywhere in the world. So such a program would look different, I guess, for an African country than for the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, insofar, I would say I'm not aware that we have that for the Philippines. It is not yet in place, but definitely we would be willing to look into that should the government of the Philippines approach us to work with them on developing such a program. Yes. And then we would certainly be able to find uh, not a standardized, but a Philippine special solution that would fit the country that would be my short answer to that question thank you so much ambassador yes there is no silver bullet in solving maritime governance issues thank you for that um, the next question is for dr amedo repolio uh, there are two questions actually what are the challenges in our human resource development in terms of expertise in the area of marine science and governance do we have the capacity to actually solve um or uh uh what do you call this solve this issue these issues in our own country yeah yeah, so we recognize, you know, the need of more human resources, more marine scientists in the Philippines, given that we have seven times total water area compared to the land area that we have. To address that, you know, the Marine Science Institute, I am a part of that effort. We are uh, developing programs to capacitate the employees of our national agencies. So we have the professional masters in tropical marine ecosystem management to do that. And we are also developing another one that will hopefully will be offered next year. So we are also developing a professional master's in operational oceanography. And then aside from the, that, you know, the UPMSI uh, is offering graduate programs in marine science for master's and PhD. And we are continuing our effort, you know, to invite those some um, career orientations for our high school students to 
encourage them to enter into marine science. Thank you for that. Um, the next question is um, security and business considerations were mentioned in your talk, but how are coasts and citizens enabled to take part or contribute to this frontier governance realm? Uh, how the citizen, you mean? Yeah, the citizens, yeah. And coastal so, communities, yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, the participation of the local communities and also incorporating the ideas of our indigenous people are very important in this endeavor. So with that, you know, we, we heard that uh, um, uh, initiative and the DNR and BMB also are encouraging or, you know, uh, strengthening that uh, initiatives and cooperations with our local communities and the IPs. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Dr. Repolio. Mm -hmm. So um, a third question is addressed to, towards Ms. Benedita Girardi on the issue on West Philippine Sea. So how should the Philippines pursue the maritime governance to counter China's maritime expansion in the West Philippine Sea in consideration with other claimant countries? So what effect does the newly released 10 dash line map of China have on uh, regional maritime uh, security? Um, so I think there is uh, clearly an element of uh, territorial claims involved that uh, should not be ignored. Um, now, I'm not a legal specialist, but I would say uh, definitely there is um, a momentum for this maritime dispute to be brought at the attention of international uh, bodies and international um, uh, and the upholding of international law. First and foremost, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. Um, it is difficult with uh, growing uh, to deal with growing assertiveness in a way mm -hmm. uh, that prevents escalation of tensions. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that should uh, first and foremost always be uh, kept in mind. An escalation of tensions, especially resulting in military conflict um, in the South China Sea, in the West Southern Sea, is definitely uh, undesirable for all mm -hmm. parties involved mm -hmm. uh, and Europe as well. So I think definitely uh, looking for legal solutions should be uh, the first and foremost uh, response. However, keeping in mind um, the delicate balance uh, of power that we, ca we currently see in the region and the undesirability of an armed conflict in a, mm -hmm. a literally quite explosive mm -hmm. yeah. uh, part of uh, the world. Thank you for that, Ms. Girardi. Um, the next question, um, may, may, maybe the ambassador could answer this question um, if you think this is uh, fit to your um, expertise. Um, is EU's strategy fit to respond to China's growing assertiveness in the South China Sea? Yeah, thanks very much. That is, of course, a question which is highly speculative, and the future will tell whether it is good enough. Um, as Ms. Girardi also said, the EU strategy is very much focused on working with countries concerned to find a peaceful solution to this problem. Um, that depends, of course, not only on the EU, but that depends also on the willingness of partners of countries concerned in the region, whether they should be willing to work on that. The EU strategy clearly is clear on issues like UNCLOS and uh, the 2016 award arbitration arbitration award thing to discuss but i think the strategy in order to um, assure maritime security in the region there are other players involved the eu and Ms. Riali was very clearly on that the eu has its limit in the, its limits in the region the eu mm -hmm. is a very important economic and political power the eu is not so much a military power what is at stake here is not only economic and political but also in a geostrategic sense it has a lot to do with the military means and that's definitely not what the eu strategy can address in the region here there was another 
question in the chat room also on maritime exercises with Germany, etc., that points in the same direction. As I clearly said in my statement, also Germany is not a maritime power in the Indo-Pacific region. So a port call, yes, that is only something we would foresee. Uh, joint exercises with the Philippine Marine probably is out of our capacities. Let me be very clear on that. We are not uh, other countries powerful, mighty countries in the region that can do that and have done that in the last weeks, as we all know. But um, Germany has a small marine, uh, which is definitely not the one that could come to rescue for the Philippines. So exercises in the sense of training coast guards, yes, that's what we do. Maritime exercises of the style the US or the Japan or the Japan or Australia are doing with the region is definitely far beyond our possibilities. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, I was just informed that you have other appointments. Um, so I would just like to um, take the opportunity to thank you for joining us for this very insightful and productive morning talking about maritime security issues. So if any one of the participants have any questions for the ambassador, um, please send them to the organizers and we, we can forward it to, to his office. Thank you so much. Thank you very much and have a good continuation of the discussion. And of course, yes. looking forward to receiving written questions with which <laughs> I will then uh, try to answer the best as I can. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, so now we continue on with our open forum for Mr. Gunther. So, um, first question for Mr. Gunther is how can governments in the private sector cooperate to track um, vessels engaged in IUU fishing, particularly in the South China Sea? Thank you for the question. I think uh, one way that that can be done is to look at how other governments have been doing it um, in the Asia region. Uh, one of the NGOs that I mentioned, uh, Global Fishing Watch, mm -hmm. recently did a very uh, in-depth well, I guess it was two years ago, in-depth uh, research on dark vessels operating in North Korea. I mentioned it before, about 800 mm -hmm. vessels found in North Korea. And that was utilizing the AI AIS information and working alongside governments like Japan, the US, Canada, and South Korea to get satellite imagery, but also to share intelligence about what's happening in those regions. So I think uh, if you want... Uh, NGOs, you want organizations, private sector people to start looking into the region, you need to start making it apparent that there is a need uh, mm -hmm. in that area for the governments uh, and for the NGOs to actually want to get involved. Um, so I think first reaching out to some of these groups um, to see if they are willing to collaborate with you and look into uh, these issues and uh, trying to understand what exactly you would need uh, for that region? Is it satellite imagery? Is it optical? Is okay. it um, night light detection? Um, all that would be very uh, important before you start reaching out to some of these groups. Okay, so the, our government must be very clear on what we want and need for, for uh, as help from other private in entities, correct? Yes, and uh, be willing to share some information uh, mm -hmm. with them. Uh, mm -hmm. look for specific regions and so on. I think a lot of governments are kind of holding on to that information. In the past, um, you know, there's groups and uh, no, no need to call them out um, mm -hmm. by name, but groups that were getting very bad names for trying to do enforcement in the maritime space on their own, NGOs. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot more NGOs now who are trying to work alongside the governments. Um, they're not trying to do things on their own. So sharing certain aspects of intelligence with them uh, mm -hmm. will be very helpful instead of um, worrying, I think. Is there any initiative in the private sector on um, information sharing and transparency? Like, is there an advocacy for that as well? There is. Um, mm -hmm. For example, again, Global Fishing Watch does transparency mm -hmm. through uh, data. Uh, trying to share governmental VMS so that you can track all vessels um, uh, linked to that country. Or, uh, as I mentioned, EU Camario uh, is trying to create an open platform 
so that all governments in certain regions can communicate more clearly about the risks happening in that area. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gunther. Um, so we go to a question on local governance for Dr. Repolio again. Um, the question is, how does the Philippine government ensure that the Philippine Development Plan through the PBSAP will attain the goals of economic development and sustained and or restored by diversity by 2028 with continuing um, unsustainable coastal development? A refined PBSAP cannot make a robust biodiversity and national economy. How do local government units of the Philippines make a contribution towards the protection of its municipal waters and maritime resources. Yeah, so I can feel no, the disheartening uh, <laughs> question regarding the unsustainable coastal development that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you heard, you know, the reclamation activities in Manila Bay, the offshore mining that we have in Cagayan, in Lingayan Gulf, and uh, the continuous sand mining activities, you know, in our coastal areas, you know, uh, these are have impact to our marine environment. And I think, uh, as a scientist, you know, uh, the first thing that we can do, you know, to ensure that we are targeting, you know, the PDP plan that we have, is to ensure that our law laws or policies are strictly implemented. And those laws and policies should be backed by science. So strict monitoring and uh, research is very important to assist our government on how to streamline our policies and on how to provide information to policymakers. Um, are there um, active monitoring efforts by like co local coastal communities or maybe the national government? Yeah, actually, there are you know monitoring efforts for those uh, activities. You know, it's a multi-tri, multi-part tri monitoring. Uh, uh, it's been going. It's a, I think it's part of the guidelines of the of our national agencies to do the monitoring. But I think the stricter one would be. Uh, helpful for the government and also, you know, the proper guidelines and implementation of a stricter policy and laws for those activities should be implemented. Have there been efforts to also increase capacity in local government units because they are the frontliners in, in yeah. fighting these uh, unsustainable development? Yeah, capacity building and education, you know, awareness to local people are also very important for them to be able to, you know, sometimes in the, the for example, for marine protected area, marine protected area actually are very uh, successful if it's locally managed, you know, by its mm -hmm. by the communities around them. And we saw that, you know, that it's very effective for the local government units to be involved and capacitating them and have an edu educational awareness for them will be a great help you know to, to ensure that we are um we have a robust biodiversity you know uh and uh in balance with our national uh economic uh, uh um for example, national economic uh development that we are planning for for, for 20, until for 2028 mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, there's um, another question uh, still for you, Dr. Ripolio. Um, for the Philippines, what are the major gaps or hurdles in maritime governance? And where should local or national economic, political, social investments focus on? Should this be focused on education or is there a particular sector that we should focus on? Yeah, I think the root cause of all of this is I think education is very important, you know, improve our capacity and um, increase the number of the marine scientists and oceanographers in the Philippines for us to be able to assist our uh, government to, to, to impose, you know, our, our uh, national uh, uh, development. Thank you so much, Dr. Repolio. Um, for our next question, this is um, for Ms. Girardi. 
So um, can you give examples like what are the interregional policies that can be strength can be enhanced to strengthen the coordination among countries to prevent intrusion of EEZs and or political boundaries while at the same time sharing benefits of marine resources? Um, well, long question, <laughs> complicated yeah. question, but I think, um, um, well, there are uh, mechanisms in place, uh, especially when it comes to um, exclusive economic zones. Uh, once more, I think in this case, especially when it concerns international law, uh, the strongest um, ally, let's say, in this case is the uh, UNCLOS Convention. Um, for example, when it comes to uh, disputed territories and, and islands and exclusive economic zones, um, well, just because of our setting, for example, um, the Philippines' uh, legal and historical claim over the Scarborough Shoal and the Kalasian Island Group, um, for example, are uh, can be addressed by a forum such as UNCLOS. Um, for a matter of fact, actually, uh, for UNCLOS, uh, the Philippine uh, sovereign, sovereignty over this area appears to be stronger uh, because the Philippine uh, exclusive economic zone, uh, well, in general, an exclusive economic zone can be declared up to 200 nautical miles, if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, uh, from the baselines. And uh, the disputed islands are, for example, 400 nautical miles closer to the Philippines than they are uh, to other states that are claimants in, in, mm -hmm. this, uh, in these cases. Um, so this is uh, an exclusive economic zone that is recognized under uh, UNCLOS. And mm -hmm. this is something that, for example, the Philippines, but other uh, claimants in such uh, instances, can bring to uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea or the International uh, Criminal Court in The Hague. Um, there is, of course, the difficult related then to uh, enforcement of such policies and international law. Uh, it is always challenging, uh, especially when you have um, superpowers involved mm -hmm. in uh, this type of disputes. Uh, and of course, uh, superpowers in both in terms of military and economic zones. Um, however, yeah, I think uh, this is an example of how a legal policy uh, mm -hmm. can help uh, resolve these issues. I don't think uh, personally that Europe can be, uh, or European states can be uh, the solution to this kind mm -hmm. of uh, issues revolving um, exclusive economic zones, et cetera, but we do have um, expertise in analyzing, for example, these legal bodies uh, mm -hmm. and these legal texts that could be uh, of service and of use to our uh, Indo-Pacific partners. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, just a follow up, because um, in a sense, the international law is already on the Philippine side in terms of this issue. But is there an entity like a multi multilateral maritime law enforcement entity that could penalize or help us uh, enforce this uh, this uh, what do you call this the law on international waters um so of institutions that are currently present mm -hmm. uh, uh it's the ones that i've already mentioned so the international mm -hmm. tribunal for the law of the sea which uh, they is based in hamburg germany mm -hmm. uh, and the international court of justice in the hague in the netherlands uh mm -hmm. Junglos also has uh, ad hoc arbitration or a special arbitral tribunal uh, that mm -hmm. could be used for certain categories of disputes. Um, mm -hmm. However, as I mentioned before, historically, uh, the enforcement of international law has always been uh, delicate. Yes. <laughs> and, and, and just simply not the easiest because um, laws are uh, construction. Uh, to mm -hmm. which state uh, can abide or not. And uh, for sure, the right way to go about this is to avoid um, physical confrontation, uh, as mm -hmm. I mentioned before. So it's difficult to find a one solution fit all. 
Uh, I do think, though, uh, continuously raising the issues and bringing it to the attention of international, uh, of the international community, it is of uh, fundamental importance. So spreading awareness uh, mm -hmm. over these uh, disputed uh, territories or claims, etc., it is the first step to bring international attention um, mm -hmm. to these pressing, uh, very pressing matters, and that can help in due course. Uh, the implementation of uh, international law. Um, but I want to be realistic here and say that, uh, of course, there is not, it's not as uh, straightforward as with national legislations and the implementation of national legislation. Thank you, Ms. Girardi. So I think this is the final question for Mr. Gunther. Uh, what would you advise for private and non-government organizations in dealing with bureaucracy such as the Philippines regarding maritime governance. For example, when local agencies, local national agencies are keeping information on themselves. I think it's really difficult. Um, I think it just takes a fair amount of trust building between the governments and the organizations that they're working with. Um, signing MOUs, um, probably working with those uh, private companies or those NGOs on a bunch of different projects before uh, all that trust can be built to be willing to share some of that mm -hmm. information. Um, I think that the governments just have to recognize that um, you know, as long as there's some type of legal standing uh, to be able to share that information, they should be willing to do so. Um, it, it can lead to a lot of different benefits. <laughs> uh, okay. For example, if we look at um, the maritime, the Chinese maritime militia in the South China Sea, if the Philippines and uh, Vietnam and other countries in the region had lists of vessels which they've identified as being members of those fleets uh, that could be provided to different research organizations who could then research what ports are they using where do we see them operating most frequently and a lot more research could be done in identifying the behaviors of those vessels um, even the ownership or whatever else um, but if that information is just being kept within the organizations and not shared then there's no way to do research or identify anything else on those vessels. Thank you for that, Mr. Gunther. So I think that um, unfortunately, this is all the time we have left for today. So um, on behalf of Facts Asia, FES Philippines, and the Foundation for the National Interest, we wish to express our warm gratitude to our speakers and participants for a very fruitful discussion. I hope that the con conversation doesn't end in this webinar. The conversation must go on because these issues must be on our headlines all the time so that um, international it, it could gain international um, awareness as well. So we hope to see you all in the last installment of the webinar series. If you have questions or concerns, you can reach us via our official Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter accounts. So before we end, may we also ask for a few minutes of your time to please answer the post-event survey in the attached link in the chat box, or you may scan the QR code on your screens. So I'll give a few moments for you to be able to scan the QR codes. So those who require um, a certificate of attendance, please be informed that you would need to accomplish this evaluation survey. So for those who would be needing a certificate of attendance, please don't forget to accomplish this evaluation survey. So again, on behalf of all the organizers, I am Denise Alcantara Garcia. We will officially close the uh, webinar. Maraming salamat po. Thank you.